Right, thanks. So uh, thanks very much, Shane, for, for the kind introduction. I'm very pleased to be with you all today. And uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen um, and get this talk underway. So um, this uh, the talk is based on a book I published in 2014. This is it, uh, The Tambor of the Eruption That Changed the World. Um, it's um, it did better than any English professor's book has a right to do. So it's um, it reached an audience that I hadn't expected. Uh, and uh, I put it down to the, um, the perennial popularity of um, volcanoes. Uh, popular among readers and sure to be popular with your students as well. So this is a talk very much about volcanic eruptions and it's um, which have the obviously the element of the spectacular. And as, as I, you know, coming to the, this particular eruption from the angle of a, an English professor and cultural historian, I was, of course, interested in, in the, um, a kind of cultural provenance for our fascination with, with, uh, with volcanic eruptions. And it does date back to the late 18th century uh, when Vesuvius uh, was particularly active. Um, and uh, here we have an image by the, the British painter Turner from a little later, from, from the, uh, um, the first decade of the 19th century with picturing Ves uh, uh, Vesuvius in full eruptive mode. Never mind that Turner had never been to Naples and never seen Vesuvius. What we, what we have is, I think, what my, my kids would call a meme by this point um, in the early 19th century that volcanoes were a, cult, were a pop cultural artifact. So something that you could buy in a print shop. Um, if, you had, if you were moneyed enough, you could make the grand tour and, and visit Mount Etna in Sicily and Vesuvius um, in, in Italy and, uh, and ascend, the, ascend the volcanoes. Um, Volcanic artifacts were beginning to, or you know, uh, bits of volcanic magma, and and were beginning to show up in uh, museums. And there's of course the enduring legacy of, of Pompeii in the cultural imagination. And you have novels, historical novels written about Pompeii, poems, etc. So um, the early 19th century is a period which in, invented so much. And perhaps I'm biased because I'm a 19th centuryist, but to, to, you know, it all ties back to the extraordinary cultural effl efflorescence of the early 19th century. You know, a massive uptake in, in uh, up, uptick in, in literacy, courtesy of Sunday schools uh, and uh, libraries, uh, publishing houses, music publishing. Everything is on this extraordinary upward curve in the late 19th, late 18th and early 19th centuries. And so it's no surprise to see with that that we have a you know that the, the, this this voracious new middle class consumer culture is looking for um, spectacular material and and volcanoes certainly belong to that. Uh, now the grand historical irony I didn't spend a great deal of time in my book writing that writing about that because it's it's all too easy a project. Um, that the, the historical irony here is that while Europeans were fast, more or less fascinated with uh, the, the smaller roster of volcanoes on the, in the Mediterranean, um, their lives were actually hugely impacted by a, an eruption on a much larger scale that occurred on the other side of the world in Southeast Asia in 1815. And that's the subject of my talk, the subject of the book, um, that in fact, uh, the world was, there was a world altering geological event that occurred in the early 19th century, the eruption of Mount Tambora, um, the, the, the victims and the sort of participants in this sort of world historical perturbation were mostly unaware of the sources of their, um, their predicament. And it's only recently, you know, only in the last several decades that we uh, have, you know, historically have been able to look back and reconstruct the global reach of, of this event. Now, it's only through particularly you know, modern advances in, in, climate, in atmospheric research, climatology, ice core research that we've been able to put together or reconstruct the, the events in the global physical system that, that resulted from the eruption of Tambora and had a, an enormous impact on the global human community, which I'll sort of sketch out for you today. I uh, bet which you can read about in, in greater detail in, in the book. Uh, and the overall lesson here, you know, for a, 
the point of view of teaching history. The lesson here is the tight imbrication of human and natural systems. You know? We're accustomed in our you know, conventional historiography to isolate human communities from their physical setting and physical surroundings uh, and the ecosystems on which they depend. Uh, we, we are, you know, we're programmed to be consumed by human dramas and conflicts uh, at the expense of understanding the connection between uh, the social and the physical. Uh, and my, so my work in, in cultural environmental history is to try to sort of overcome that, that inherited bias we have toward the social and the human and to, uh, as it were, sort of um, refocus our attention or create, give a more sort of balanced account of uh, human history and case studies in human history where we can see the relationship between human systems and physical systems. This is a, and as a case study, oh, I recommended this to you as a sort of terrific illustration of how dependent we are on uh, stable environments. And when we enter into unstable environments, tragedies and catastrophes do occur. So, uh, we're talking about a volcano in six degrees south in the southern hemisphere. Well, I think one of the you know, terrific things you can probably tell from my accent that I'm, you know, I'm not really from the North Atlantic. I'm from Australia. So I, my work in environmental history has taken me, uh, taken me global and often to the southern hemisphere, and in this case to the southeast to Southeast Asia, what was then known as the colonial Dutch East Indies, uh, and to so an island here. Uh, can you see? I hope you can see my cursor. I'm pointing to um, the west yes, coast. We can see it. Good, good. The west coast of an island called Simbawa, Sumbawa. I mean, I, I, perhaps you've heard of the island of Bali, Bali where Australians um, annually make fools of themselves uh, on the beaches and in the bars. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Sumbawa is an island so, a little to the east and um, the host of the, of the the Tambora volcano, which erupted with cataclysmic force on April 10th and 11th of 1815. Uh, and this is the topography of, the, of this area of the, of the Pacific. And um, it belongs to, Tambora belongs to, which I'm sure you're familiar with, the, the ring of fire, the so-called ring of fire of volcanoes that um, around that particular tectonic plate that circles the, the Pacific and reaches all the west coast of the United States also. Um, and uh, Tambor is one of the larger, part of a large volcanic system. Uh, so here we have a rather idyllic colonial print of, of village life as it was in the colonial Dutch East Indies in the early 19th century, which was about to be, which was regularly interrupted by volcanic eruptions. Right, so the, the indigenous pe peoples of this of this area were very much habituated to to um, to volcanic disturbances, but not on the scale of Tambora. Tambora was even by you know, relative to the historical experience of that region something completely off scale uh, for them. So this is the, how the eruption occurred. So what I'm what, you'll notice that what I'm doing here is I'm really shifting modes and I hope more or less seamlessly between historical style narrative and cultural contextualization and important science notes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so the, the two are the two language, these idioms become interweaved with each other. And just before, you know, before I give you a few science slides that, you know, what, that are not particularly detailed or, or arcane. Um, uh, my philosophy about uh, teaching, teaching science in, in historical contexts or cultural contexts is, um, uh, I call it the three C's, which is con conversance, competence, and, and case studies. So what do I mean by that? It's this, uh, in our disciplinary environment in education, and I mean secondary education and higher education, uh, we are siloed into various disciplines. Uh, we have the humanities and the social sciences and we have the physical sciences and, and never the twain shall meet. Um, and each has its own peculiar disciplinary languages and there's not, there's not sufficient conversation between them. Uh, and 
or students are tend to be intimidated by technical science you know, scientific languages and the first barrier to overcome is that kind of the feeling of intimidation and the feeling of not not being permitted or being sort of prohibited from entering into discussions or um, following um, uh, you know, following ideas and, uh, and and narratives into that is kind of what's considered a scientific domain. So we the standards that we have are are really at the level of expertise. Uh, if someone is a science major here at the a geology major here at the University of Illinois, they have to meet certain, take certain courses, meet certain standards, and be um, you know achieve a level of expertise in that particular discipline and language. What I'm talking about, and this is how I teach my students, is that let's lower that bar from this, the disciplinary standards of, of expertise down to this level of competence and conversance. Uh, do you have a basic understanding of key ideas and key formulas within a particular science, in this case, volcanology, but in other points in the book, it's climatology or glaciology. You know, these key physical system sciences that are already neglected in our secondary education curricula, you know, what do we have? We have my student, my, my kids are going through the system right now. It's biology, physics, and chemistry. And there's very, you no, know, there's almost no earth science to be seen, which I think is, a, a, to my mind, a travesty for, you know, 21st century education, that earth science should be um, absolutely featured, given the, the, the problems and predicaments that our students are going to be facing in their personal and professional lives, which will all connect to the environmental and uh, and physical and earth sciences. Um, so what are we, you know, what's our responsibility as educators? Our, you know, our responsibility is to begin to insinuate this material through the curriculum at every level. And I'm sure I'm pre preaching to the choir here. Uh, it's, um, it's, this has certainly been sort of my mission as a writer and educator uh, in, the part in, in the last 10, 15 years since I sort of made my conversion experience, which, um, which signaled a move from writing about, you know, Music and art in London in the in around 1800s to writing about the you know glaciers and volcanoes etc and climate change. So okay, so that was a long preface to this slide, which is shows a Plinian eruption. So a reference to Pliny the Pliny the Elder and Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger, um, who wrote the first account of uh, Vesuvius eruption, uh, the one that destroyed Pompeii. And uh, Plinian eruption is one, and this is important from a physical point of view that it it um, it ejects upward into the atmosphere, penetrates the atmosphere to the stratosphere. All right, so uh, people, when I, when I was writing this book, I'd get the question about, well, you know, was St. Helens, for instance, Mount St. Helens, which erupted in 1980, and something on people's sort of memory horizon in the United States, did that have an impact on climate? And the answer to that is the impact of Mount St. Helens on, on climate was nil, because the, the mountain blew out sideways, right? So all the volcanic matter, all the, the gas and ash blew out sideways, no effect whatsoever, did not penetrate the atmosphere at all. So we require a certain style of eruption, a Plinian style of eruption. Also, geographical location on the planet is extremely important. So the other questions I get are about, say, you know, the Iceland volcanoes that have a tendency to pop off in, in recent years and one that disrupted European air travel for about a week a few years ago. Um, these North Atlantic volcanoes can be uh, extremely disruptive regionally, but they can't, it's impossible for them from a sort of geophysical point of view to have a global impact because the, the gases and matter ejected from them do not enter into the global atmospheric circulation, right? For that, you require a volcano that's located near to the, is proximate to the equator. And so that's what we have with Tambora, six degrees south of the equator. It's, uh, it's, geogra it's geographically, um, it, it's located in a geographically uh, suitable position and it's of a suitable scale uh, in order to actually cause global climate change, which is the, the story that we're, um, you know, the story of, of the book. So as you see from the two slides, the Plinian eruption is the initial explosion and only about 5% of this, uh, of the, the volcanic aerosol cloud that Tambora will produce is actually from the first eruption. Right, from that initial eruption. The second slide on the right, the so-called so pyroclastic flows. And that's about as technical as, my, um, as my, my narrative becomes. These pyroclastic flows, which are the flow of lava down the side of the mountain, they create secondary explosions, as you see, those clouds 
um, erupting vertically from hydrographic flows. In fact, most of the volcanic matter issues from, from these, from the flows down the mountain. Um, and uh, this is the, the crater that's left behind. Uh, this is a picture that I took from the rim of Tambora. I climbed two days through the jungle, <laughs> picking leeches off, you know, sleepless days in the jungle, picking leeches off my legs and arms, and finally arriving at the, the rim of the, of the crater, which is six miles around and almost a mile down. Uh, and you, can see, you can't quite see it in this image, which is not the greatest, but um, you know, there's a lake at the bottom, and there are little wispy clouds of sulfur uh, in, the, in the crater, which give an indication of the, you know, the, some indication of what's occurring um, subterraneally. Uh, and when I was there, the, 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 the odor of sulfur was quite intense. And my tour guide turned to me and he said, I hope today's not the day. Um, and uh, within a week, everyone had been from the area had been evacuated because Tambora was, was rumbling, but there's no real, um, from a prob you know, volcanic probability point of view, no real likelihood of it, of it erupting again in a major way in the near future. But we, as with, with volcanoes, we really don't know. You know our predictive power as with earthquakes, as you would know in California, our predictive power is, is pretty weak. Um, so a massive caldera that is, can be seen from space. And if any of you are, you know, know or visited Crater Lake in Oregon, um, we're talking about a, a volcanic eruption in a crater of, of those dimensions. Um, here's a, here's a, a, a photo from NASA. So we're, this is a major geological event. Uh, and to give you some some, you know, to refer back to this issue of the, what J.P. Snow called the two cultures, science on one side and humanities on the other. Here I was, a full-fledged English professor, uh, a couple of books behind me, and um, taking a class in atmospheric sciences out of curiosity back about 15 years ago, and where there were lectures about the relationship between, the, the professor was focusing on the relationship between volcanism and climate and climate change. It was very interesting to me. And he kept referring back to this uh, 1815 volcano uh, and I had never heard of it. So the, I mean, the Greeks talk about shame as being a very sort of positive, <laughs> as, as being a, a, a potentially positive impulse or feeling. One feels shame, then one reforms oneself or one you know, shifts in a, diff, in a new direction as a, as a result of feeling shame. Uh, I, I did feel, um, you know, intellectual shame that uh, here I was, a, a professor of early 19th century studies and 1815, of course, you know, it's the, the Battle of Waterloo, the end of the Napoleonic period. It's, it's like right in the heart of my period. And here I was completely unaware of this, this global event that had occurred. Uh, and pretty soon I realized that there was, there was a whole book to be written on this subject that, as a remedy for my own ignorance, um, first of all. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, and it, it turned out that well, I was. This was a problem that we didn't have these narratives about uh, the the Earth system. Um, and uh, so, what I'm presenting to you is a kind of an approach, a way, a, a way of thinking about creating case studies that that involve both the Earth system and the human social system. So the the um, 100,000 people died is the highest known mortality of, from a volcanic eruption in the historical record. It wiped out. The, here is some pottery that's been excavated from archaeological sites. Certainly indigenous languages disappeared overnight because their own, all the native speakers were, were killed. Um, now, what happened, again, here's a science slide that I throw in. So what actually happens then? So, so from regional disaster, right? It was a regional disaster in, the South, in Southeast Asia. The sun didn't shine for a week. You had fluorine poisoning from, um, uh, from the rain, uh, poisoning wells, causing water devastation, you know, the killing of crops. So we can imagine, we can readily imagine a, a regional disaster. That's within the ordinary scope of our thinking. But what I'm asking you know, my readers to do, and you to do now, is to think beyond the idea of a disaster narrative to what it means to have the entire global um, climate system disrupted. Um, by this event or say by carbon emissions as we are you know, experiencing today. Um, so here in this case, we have the Plinian eruption cloud and, and uh, the various gases um, uh, ejected by it, you know, particularly um, sulfur dioxide. Now what happens is that most of this matter is washed out in the, in the ensuing weeks, 
okay? But what is important is the, the amount of matter that is, penetrates the atmosphere to the stratosphere. We're talking about 40 kilometers above the Earth. And then is, because it's beyond the reach of the atmosphere and gra the gravitational pull and the, the weather systems of the atmosphere, it, it penetrates beyond that and sits up in the quiet stratosphere there. Uh, and by various, you know, interacts with uh, oxygen rich air and by degrees forms um, a, an aerosol cloud, or a sulfate aerosol cloud as um, sulfuric acid. Okay. Uh, and so what you've got to imagine is a kind of, yeah, this giant veil, aerosol veil forming um, in the stratosphere and then gradually dispersing until it covers the entire planet. That's an enormous amount of matter to cover the planet. Uh, and one volcanologist described it to me this way. He said, well, think about the amount of matter that was ejected by Tambora is if you took the entire topsoil of Illinois and Texas and, and transplanted it into the, into the stratosphere, it, that give you some sense of the amount of material that we're talking about being transferred from beneath the earth uh, up, into the, up into the atmosphere, sorry, into the stratosphere. Um, so, uh, and then it begins, oh, this is, why don't I go to, I'll go to this slide, then I'll go back to that other interesting art slide. Um, so what you have is that, first of all, in the weeks after the eruption, the, um, the aerosol cloud circles the equator. And here we're talking about, now we're talking about atmospheric circulation. We've stopped talking about volcanology, really. Now we're talking about um, climatology and, and atmospheric science. So it circles the atmosphere and then begins, as you see on this slide, a kind of polewood drift. And those lighter areas are, this is, what is this? What are, what are you actually looking at? This is a modeled reconstruction. Obviously, this is not a historical representation, but it's a modeled eruption of what the Tambora cloud, how it would probably have been behaving about six months after the eruption. So in late 1815, we have um, the aerosol cloud at its thickest in these mid latitudes in both the Southern and Northern hemispheres and already beginning to wreak havoc with uh, the major weather systems in both hemispheres. And that will be sort of the, the main problem for global humanity in the years 1816, 17 and 18 is the extraordinary level of disruption of our, the weather systems on which we, we relied for, for crops, uh, for agriculture um, and for you know, basic infrastructure. Um, so here we have, yeah, here's the model. I wanted to go back to this, this slide here, which, because I know we have a few art historians in the audience and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm, uh, that all of you are interested in, in connections with, with art history here. So this is a, um, a painting by Kaspar David Friedrich, the, the romantic German painter. So famous, famous artist from the period. This is uh, from a, 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 a port in the Baltic Sea. And this is taken at midday. I mean, it's like, this is a painting, this is a rendering of, of volcanic skies um, as they were in, in 1815. So I, I want you to imagine, see, I think this is important for students too, isn't it? To, under, to have a kind of sensual reckoning with this historical event as a lived experience. And to understand that for several years on planet earth, the sun would never properly shone because it was being filtered through this volcanic aerosol veil. The sun was dim, weak, watery. It was, uh, I mean, I worked through these weather journals uh, for, a, for this period and you have people who are just amateurs, you know, uh, clergymen, um, uh, amateur gentlemen keeping their weather diaries. Uh, and they, in 1816, they recorded zero sunny days, zero, you know, because nothing qualified as, as sunshine. So, you know, think, imagine the, how demoralizing the, the effect of that would be for, for you know, villagers and peasants and, and everyone globally to have, you know, the, there's no, the, the, everything is cold. The weather systems are haywire, you know, precipitation is haywire, the sun never really shines. It seems like a kind of divine judgment on, uh, on humanity. And certainly it was interpreted that way by, you know, by people and cultures across the globe that this, this is some sort of apocalyptic event, you know, a kind of day of judgment. And it lingered, this, this, this strange volcanic, these, these skies lingered for a couple of years. Um, 
and I'm not just making this up about this painting. There's an extraordinary couple of um, papers written by a atmospheric scientist who was interested in art history, and he 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 did a an analysis of the paintings, a pigment analysis, looking at the ratio of volcanic colors, reds and yellows, etc., uh, and it, it, seeing if he could connect. Um, paintings from that particular period to volcanic events. Uh, and he came up with a very, with a surprisingly close correlation between volcanic events and the ways in which skies are rendered by notable European artists. And it's this painting of all the 500 years worth of landscape paintings that he looked at that had the highest, that depicted the densest possible volcanic aerosol cloud. So we tend to think of romanticists and romantic art as projecting their own inner feelings onto the atmosphere and, you know, the, a, a red sky and, you know, is, is projecting inner turmoil onto, um, onto the landscape. Well, this is a, something of a sort of correction to that, you know, almost naive romanticism is that no, Friedrich is actually picturing it as it was. This is not an expression of inner turmoil. This is his rendering, a close rendering of what he saw you know, outside his window um, in uh, the, the summer of 1815. So, okay, now here's an important slide where let's zoom out for a moment. And uh, I wanna give you the, um, a sense of the different threads of this global story that I pick up in the book are really a chapter devoted to, to each of these stories. Uh, and a couple of, um, sort of terms to, to throw out to you, some sort of conceptual apparatus. Um, the idea of a long tail, the idea that these, that geological events of this scale have a long tail in terms of consequences. Now here's where we think about, so we need to think about creatively about temporality and history and timelines, uh, that an event in April of 1815 in, uh, in, the South, in Southeast Asia can have consequences that ripple out decades and even centuries. And that's certainly the case of, of the impact on the disease ecology of the Bay of Bengal in India. Um, and I'll talk more about that particular example. Um, the effects are still being uh, you know, felt today. Um, in, in China, there was a three year famine uh, and uh, as a result of which the, the local farmers switched their agricultural crop to the cash crop of opium. So we have sort of the origins of what we know as the golden triangle here in the, in the Tambora period as a direct result, direct slash indirect result of the climate crisis. We have a complete change in the economy uh, and the agriculture of Southwest China. In Europe, there's, there's near famine conditions, a typhus epidemic, et cetera. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the talk. United States, I'll talk a bit, I'll talk about that. There's a, a boom and bust. There's a, a huge investment of, of resources into the grain growing regions in the Midwest. Um, uh, a migration, an enormous migration of peoples from the failing, failed farms and failed communities in New England out to the Midwest. I wonder how many of you teach, uh, teach this in your, in your American history classes. I know that my, my kids went through, they, they did three years on the Founding Fathers and then one on the Civil War and that was really it. And in this sort of in-between nether zone where in fact so many important um, sort of things occurred in American history and the the one to which Tambora is directly connected is the Panic of 1819, the first major economic depression in the United States directly connected to the climate crisis resulting from Tambora's eruption. I can talk a little bit more about that. And also I have um, chapters about the Arctic um, and uh, that's a strange story, that one. And also uh, about Switzerland. Uh, so the, and the second, the second term that I have here on the slide, the idea of teleconnection. Now that's, I haven't, that's not a neologism. I haven't made up that word. That's a word that atmospheric scientists use to describe the relationship between remote events and places. And to me, when I began to see this word teleconnection crop up in atmospheric science papers, I thought, what a useful, what a useful word. <laughs> We're used to thinking about causation Again, looping back to my earlier points about how 
conventional ways of thinking about historiography and, and describing um, anthropocentric events uh, and their relationships, we, we're, we're trained to think of mostly in terms of proximate causes, right? That, you know, things need to happen, you know, they need to occur approximately in, in space and time in order for there to be a relationship and everything else is purely speculative and we, we need to train ourselves to be quite rigorous in thinking how, uh, think about causal relationships. Well, actually coming into this through the sciences is, is somewhat liberating because when you come to an idea like teleconnections, no, there actually, <laughs> there are these relationships between events that are distant in space and time. Uh, and uh, it's simply, you know, to be intellectually rigorous, actually, you know, it, it's important not to bury those connections, but to, uh, really to, to examine them. Uh, and when you look at uh, a, a case study such as Tambora, and this is true of the Little Ice Age in, in general, of course, that you see relation, you, first of all, you need a global scale. You need to extend your ordinary timelines from our kind of annual decade or timelines to millennial times, time frames. And when we're talking about geology to deep time, to millions of years, we have to, like, we have to uh, pan out uh, and see the larger teleconnections between events. So, um, so you, you might be saying, well, I need an example in order to understand this idea of teleconnection. So, um, let's let's move into these specific examples. Um, so, I mean, I can imagine a class on about the about climate and migration that you might want to teach, where you you give a case study example of eighteen sixteen in um, in in the United States, and then then um, connect that to the forms of you know forced and voluntary climate migration that we're seeing today from various parts of the world and we'll continue to see. Um, so what are we looking at here? We're looking at a, it's a rather crude map, but it gives you a sense of where the snow line was in early June in 1816. So you have snow during the crop growing season in, in Vermont and Maine and New Hampshire. Um, this is a product of the depressed temperatures and altered precipitation patterns from, from Tambora. Uh, and this is probably more illustrative if you look at these three graphs, look at that low point there, 1816, this is the number of um, crop growing days in a particular season. So you can see the extraordinary anomaly, weather anomaly as it impacts agriculture. So we're looking back, I mean, we're no less reliant on ag agriculture, obviously, but in 200 years ago, um, subsistence agriculture was the, was the mainstay of most communities in the world. And so you know, there's extraordinary human reliance on agriculture. And when you have a season like this, uh, where um, uh, a, 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 an extreme anomaly here in terms of the foreshortening of the growing season, you have ruinous and catastrophic human consequences. And so it turned out you had entire villages in Vermont shutting down. I mean, the population of Vermont uh, it was depleted by 20 or 30% over a couple of years. And, uh, and Thai villages packing up and leaving. So those marginal farmland in the northeast part of the country, um, it, uh, people saw the writing on the wall. They, they weren't to know that this was not permanent, right? That volcanic, that the residency of volcanic aerosols in the atmosphere is only two to three years and that eventually, you know, by 1819, things would return to normal. They had no way of understanding that. They believed that conditions were just getting worse and they upped and left. And so we had families like this one pictured here crossing the Appalachians on foot, uh, Appalachian Mountains on foot and heading to heading to the west. So you have the first mass westward migration in US history occurring. Um, and to look at two maps here from, this is a map from 1810, and just look at the difference from this map to 1820. So we have the creation of six new states, a major influx of population and investment in, um, in that where I'm speaking from today here in Illinois, uh, the Midwest, uh, just to give you a sense of, well, you might be asking, well, how did the panic occur? I don't know why. So we had this westward migration, um, uh, you know, how do we come and, and if, if crop growing conditions return to normal in, in 1819, then what's the problem? Well, it's a great example of how of the complexity of these relationships between um, between climate deterioration and, um, and and human communities and our 
social systems. Uh, in this case, the by a pure climatological accident, the areas west of, them, of uh, the west of the Appalachians were mostly spared the worst meteorological impacts, while the eastern seaboard was very badly hit. So there's much much greater reliance on crop growing here in the, the frontier northwest, as it was then called, and the northwest as it is now. Just to give you a data point, the number of flatboats, grain carrying flatboats um, heading down the Mississippi to the New Orleans port quintupled in a single year. Uh, and the value of um, the value of land, of agricultural land in the frontier northwest went through the roof. Um, uh, so you have extraordinary amounts of money being invested, specul speculative investment here um, in the Midwest. Uh, but once the, the 1819, the climate disaster is, is over and the, the, the agricultural regions in the, the eastern seaboard, eastern seaboard, eastern seaboard return to normal, then you have, um, of course, everyone loses their shirt. All the investors lose their money in, um, in the West, they've invested in the West, uh, and um, there's a crash. The first major economic crash. So you can see here, this is teleconnection, right? This is teleconnection. And so you have the Tambor eruption, you have disrupted weather systems, you have its impact in the northeast and, um, and, and the eastern seaboard, uh, and then you have a westward migration. And then a few years later, you have an, a long tail of economic consequences, which ends up in a uh, uh, an economic disaster from which the United States didn't recover until half you know, until halfway through the 1820s really. Um, and uh, it's an episode in American history is well worth remembering, particularly for its connection to climate disruption, because right? this is exactly the kinds of scenarios that we're entering into now where we have to attempt to, to describe and measure the relationship between climate disruption and disruption of our um, social and human infrastructures. Um, so uh, now the second example I'm going to give is perhaps even more spectacular, I would say. Um, and I can imagine you, you know, teaching a unit on climate and disease. Um, and uh, certainly there are connections between climate or environmental change, at least, and COVID, for instance, or the destruction of wildlife habitats. So we're always thinking about relationships between disease, diseases and uh, changing disease ecology and environmental change. So here's a map of India, colonial India, as it was in the early 19th century. And our story will take place um, here in the Bay of Bengal. Now, Bay of Bengal is host to the, the lar largest and most powerful weather system in the world, which is the, the Indian monsoon. Uh, and, uh, it, and here's an you know, opportunity to, to teach your students on just a bit of basic science. So in uh, the monsoon operates by a temperature differential between the, the sea and the land. The land heats up more quickly than the, than the sea, uh, and low, pre low pressure system sits over the Indian subcontinent and sucks in all the water vapor from the surrounding bay. So you have a parched dry landscape for much of the year, um, and then three months of the year you have these inundating rains. And the entire human economy, you know, the entire ecosystem and the human economy of India has always depended upon the arrival of the monsoonal rains. Well, what happens in 1816 was that you have a depression of temperatures, right? So that, that temperature differential is narrowed. So the en energy is drained away from the system, right? And there's this, this lag. So there's no water vapor creating as it should over, over the land and the rains are deferred and delayed, right? So first of all, you have this extreme weather disaster in India in 1816, which is a drought. And then finally, when the, the uh, monsoon does stir into action, it creates unseasonable flooding rains, like at the wrong time of year, 100 year floods. So we go from extreme drought conditions to extreme flood conditions, like very much analogous to the kinds of situation we're seeing today. Right? And this is happening in India in 1816, 1817. And again, this would be a regional disaster having to do with sort of drought and floods, etc. except that there was um, there was a joker in the pack um, that had to do with um, the, the, the Ganges Delta and the altered with these, these fluctuating conditions, shifting between 
uh, between drought and floods, there was some, a biological event occurred, right? Its details are shadowy, but we do know that it, it must have occurred, not a mutation in cholera, but a genetic transfer event whereby the, the endemic cholera bacteria um, changed its sort of shape and became um, uh, virulent to a, whole, to a whole new human community. So it, cholera had been endemic to the Bay of Bengal from time immemorial, but with the changed disease ecology due to the extreme weather in the Bay of Bengal in 1816, a genetic transfer event causes a new cholera to emerge. And what happens? I'm sure you know, or, or, you know, any of you would know that there is no history of the 19th century without cholera. I mean, it creates the modern uh, concept of public health infrastructure as we know it, and was a global phenomenon that killed tens of millions of people. Uh, here's the microbe as it was discovered by Edward Koch in, uh, in the 1880s. So that it wasn't actually identified until the 1880s as this particular microbe. Uh, and here's the global spread of cholera originating in the Bay of Bengal in 1817, 1818, making its way through Eurasia to Europe by 1830, 1831, and then making its way to the United States uh, by 1832. So a major world historical event by any reckoning is, uh, is the cholera uh, and that can be traced back again to this one event. So this one geological perturbation, which is the eruption of Tambora. So you know, we're, we're sort of learning, you know, I hope we're you know, learning to think along different pathways, pathways that lead us from you know, a single event in, in time and space and moving in a teleconnected fashion outwards um, and understanding the full ramifications to understand their full ramifications and measure their full impacts. So I'm getting, um, I've got, I want to leave time for questions. I'm sure Shane would like me to, to finish I up. Would, I would like you, questions. Yeah, okay, yeah, great. Because um, I, I have, I'll, I'll leave the, some slides up if that's okay in case- I Yeah, please keep going, about. keep going. I think we're, some, I think we're happy. cultural about. things as, as we go. But Matt, I think I'd like to just get some people's thoughts and questions and, and I can show some more slides if the opportunity arises. Sure. Um, I have a few, um, and I will just call the people who um, raised them to unmute and ask themselves. We've had kind of a lively conversation about um, this question of causation in different in, in, uh, different instances. Oh, good, good. good. Um, and so the first one um, was, Elizabeth, do you want to unmute and ask your question about the Dust Bowl? Sure. So um, what my question was is, dissipation into the stratosphere, the same thing that made the dust from the Dust Bowl go over to Washington, DC. And I'm asking that question specifically because that's an example that my US history students would absolutely know about. So it would help make those two connections, but I'm not sure if it is true. Right, so in that case, the, um, so those, the, the Dust Bowl, the dust would be carried by prevailing winds mm -hmm. um, across, you know, in an easterly direction the United States. And um, we're talking about the volcanic aerosols in this case um, have been ejected beyond the atmosphere. So beyond the, the prevailing winds that we experience mm -hmm. here on the surface of the planet and beyond our weather systems. You know, there's a kind of cutoff point in the atmosphere uh, and then you enter the stratosphere. And so it was, it was those, it was that matter, that dust and gas that's sitting above the weather on, on the on the surface that had the that had the major impact. There's a certain point at which these aerosols, you know, these tiny microscopic aerosols of sulfate, sulfuric acid, they become plump enough that they both uh, filter out the radiative uh, energy of the sun uh, and also the infrared rays returning from the Earth. Right? They be, they reach a certain kind of density where they're filtering heat out. Um, uh, in both directions and just creating this overall cooling effect on the planet. So you have parts of, of, of so Tambor is a cooling event, let's you know, make that clear. So, but uh, you think what's important from the point of view of a case study is that it's the, um, we're used to operating, our human communities are used to operating with a narrow band, within the narrow band of temperature fluctuation, right? Uh, and even when we talk about the little ice age, we're talking about a narrow, Band of fluctuation, you know, and uh, over you know, between say 1250 and, and 1850, 
right? Uh, and um, it's uh, what we're facing now in the 21st century is a, uh, a, 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 an increase in temperatures beyond any kind of historical narrow band of our experience. So I think that you know, teaching the little ice age, you'd be happy to be careful to say this is an instance of climate disruption, but it's nothing like what we'll be facing in the 21st and 27th centuries. Um, and what was interesting to me in particular about Tambora was that no, it, it was um, that Tambora took us at, well outside the narrow band for a couple of years. So you have temperature depressions of four, five, six, seven um, degrees, and you know flooding rains in summertime and all the impacts on agriculture. But you know, I think that you know the, the, the Dust Bowl case study uh, and the Tambora case study would sit really well side by side because they're ultimately both about agriculture. That's true. Thank you so um, much. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask, um, Robbie, do you want to, uh, you had a series of questions, uh, maybe don't ask quite all of them now, but do you want to ask one or two of them? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> thank you so much for, for your talk so far. Um, I was curious, uh, I think this kind of like touches on maybe a lot of what a lot of people were saying, but um, in terms of like framing climate as this driving force, solely or not, or kind of more than others, I was curious about how that might like overshadow or undermine like uh, agency. Uh, we've been talking a lot about like Eurocentrism and specifically like there was a slide about like Tambor's impact and like very briefly you were talking about regions and I was curious if like, um, like how you kind of address the like resilience or adaptations within those regions or countries say, you know, in China or India to, to changing climate without it being like, um, maybe like a victim kind of narrative? Very, very good questions. And yeah, I, I, I don't have a kind of clear prescriptive set of answers. I think, you know, this, these are deep intellectual questions, you know, uh, that, that we all wrestle with. Um, and I would say that perhaps I'm offering a corrective, you know, well, this, this, kind of, this, this kind of narrative, which focuses on um, the global physical system and, and its capability to upset, um, you know, to upset social and cultural norms, economies, infrastructures, and what have you, the, the kind of level of disruption that we're talking about actually is you know, globally disempowering uh, and that it creates a set of circumstances that is beyond uh, any kind of conventional t tolerance level uh, within which you know, um, our communities are, uh, are adapted. So uh, let me rephrase that perhaps in a, um, more simply, is that we, if we think about adaptation and resilience, right, as that if, uh, communities living at particular latitudes or in partic within particular eco ecosystems having adapted to those and being adapted to fluctuations within a sort of the natural band of variability, okay? We think about resilience within natural variability. We're talking about um, uh, changes, uh, changes in ecological conditions that are outside the scope of natural variability and therefore test resilience to a breaking point, right? And create kind of social and, and civil disruption. And so, I mean, just looking at this slide here, where, you know, that, what is this? This is a, a, a little climate, a little climate change memorial. It's a, it's, um, it's German uh, where, uh, and it has, it's like, a, it's a, a memento mori of those who died, right? And these became popular, it was like pop art. Uh, and you saw similar things after 9-11, um, little pop art cropping up. And so it has pictures of the, of the scenes of the European disaster. So you, hit, you have the, the, um, the lightning and the thunder and villages leaving their, their farms. So you have climate refugees flooding the, the byways of Europe. You have a pre, uh, an apocalyptic preacher, in this case, the Baroness de Kruder, preaching to her flock. And she um, you know, spent her riches on feeding the poor and impoverished, etc. And here on the other, on the obverse of, of the medallion, you have the prices of grain as they were. So this is a kind of a memorial. So never forget 
how much it costs to buy a loaf of bread in 1816 and 1817, right? Um, so, I mean, these, these are testimonies to resilience uh, and these are artifacts of traumatic memory, yeah? Um, and uh, I, I think that, I mean, just, I'll say one more thing about Europe here is that one, one thesis that I test in the, in the book is to say that this was a shock to the European system, uh, into the European political class and, and ruling class. Um, the, the prevailing ideology at the time was absolutely laissez-faire, right? No relationship between government and social services, uh, though that whatever there was was left to the churches. Uh, but it was after this event and after some of the scenes that we see represented here on these, uh, you know, on these, these, these medals, um, that we begin the, the begin to see the first outlines of what we'd come to think of as a welfare state. Just the, the first stirrings of, an, of a new ideology that would, would say, would, would mandate that the governments actually owe the people a certain level of support and emergency help. Uh, in times of crisis. This idea had not existed before in Europe, but you begin, for instance, Br Britain sets up its first board of public health in 1818 to respond to the crisis in Ireland. Right? So you, and um, you get a new concept of public spending, public works programs to put people to work in times of, uh, of, of crisis uh, so that there are, you know, there's money percolating through the system and you don't have scenes of humanitarian disaster unfolding you know, all across Europe. So there are ways of telling an adaptation and resilience story. Absolutely. I wanted to clarify your explanation of this image because it, uh, uh, it sounded so, uh, I can sympathize, but it, it was hard to, it felt like pretty deep uh, removed from like the human cost, like to, to literally have a memorial be like, like about the prices that like I understand it's evocative but it, so just to clarify like what the images are showing the left the kind of left dial is about the high cost of of uh agricultural products and the, and the it's not about mourning people who were lost necessarily it's like the reminder of how expensive things were well yeah and there's a direct relationship between that and famine conditions right so you know, there are lost family members, lost community members because of, of starvation conditions. So you have corpses by the roadside in Europe. Um, and uh, you have mothers abandoning their children because they can't feed them, right? And you have mothers being, and those mothers in Switzerland, there was a crackdown on infanticide. And so mothers were beheaded, summarily beheaded for infanticide. In this period, uh, and you know, this is one of the train of horrors that I was able to trace a, across the entire globe. Was was in fact one of the, the gory threads here was infanticide, families abandoning their children because they they couldn't feed them. Yeah, so it's more than just high prices. I think that's a really interesting <clears throat> uh, connection between this little piece right here and also the um, the paintings that you were showing because we were talking about also what was showing up in the chat was this question about you know um, the extent to which the painting is a sort of documentary evidence or whether it's an artist interpretation and one of the things that I wanted to um, say that I think connects to Shugato's talk earlier this week is, and I think it's more evident in this piece um, on the climate and culture slide is that a piece could be both almost a photographic representation of something or a documentary on one level, but, but the meaning that it has is different to the people who created it than it is to us when we see it. And so I think that's another piece to keep in mind when we're thinking about what Shibato was saying about not taking something purely as a documentary piece of evidence that, that a, a, an almost photographic representation is still an artistic interpretation um, because the person has chosen what to do. And, be, and so when we're looking at this thing for the price of bread or the price of grain, it doesn't have the emotional resonance for us looking at it that it would to a person who recognized a time of starvation where that might've 
been a reminder of that. So I think that that's a, like in a classroom case, that could be a really useful lesson to show them this, you know, chart of the price of bread and ask them, you know, what are you seeing? And then to give them this additional information and say, okay, what are you seeing again? Like, how do you interpret that in this? And that was what Shugata was saying about artworks as well, was to, to ask students to look at them once, give a little bit additional information, look at them again. Um, so so I, mean, I, I mean, this leads uh, into an, you know, into the area of how to, you know, the symbolic imaginary, you know, how do these events get translated culturally? How do they, they live on? And I, I, I can't leave a talk about Tambora without talking about, um, well, there's a picture by Constable of, uh, you know, weather system pouring in from the, from the, from, uh, from the North Atlantic, you know, the, the latitudinal bands of precipitation change and, and everything gets flooded in Europe. Of course, we end up with, on the shores of Lake Geneva with a teenage Mary Shelley uh, and on a summer vacation, as they'd hoped with you know, Lord Byron, Lake Geneva, of course, it ends up a terrible um, damp squib. Uh, and they decide because they're confined indoors, they um, turn their hand to ghost stories. Uh, this is the villa, uh, this is the artist's impression of the Villa Diodati. Uh, and with um, uh, Byron languishing, or is it Shelley, languishing out here in the garden, composing deathless poetry. Uh, and um, out of these, you know, these scenes of, it's like they toured the glaciers, which were, you know, encroaching on farmland and, you know, this cold, this, little, this moment, this last hurrah of the little ice age really, uh, you know, creates the, the idea of, of Frankenstein and the monster in, in Mary Shelley's imagination. And the reading that I give uh, of, of Frankenstein in, in the Tambora book is that he's actually, you know, he's not a figure of scientific hubris or industrialization, or uh, he's actually a figure of the of humanitarian crisis. He's a composite figure of the suffering peasantry of of Europe who are um, who are, have taken to the to the highways of Europe um, in search of food. Right. There are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of climate refugees um, in, uh, in rural Europe at this time, uh, within miles of where uh, Mary Shelley was sitting and, and uh, drafting, drafting Frankenstein. And there, there are certain lines from Frankenstein that's, that speak to the event. He talks about, you know, no, no, no man loves the wretched. Uh, and uh, it was, we have instances of that all across the historical record in Europe of the, the burghers of, the, of local market towns shutting their gates against the, the starving poor from the, the village communities. So you have a level of sort of desperation and suffering in Europe that uh, to my reading and the reading that I offer in the book is like transmuted symbolically through her you know, Gothic imagination into this fable of Frankenstein and the monster. And you know, you think of his, the story, he, he just wanders around being like abused and neglected and, and banished from any any human community he, he comes in contact with, as it's he's the uh, uh, he's the stigmatized climate refugee. Um, I love that. I noticed there were a lot of people in the chat who were like, "Yes, it's fascinating." <laughs> um, I, um, I there are two more questions that I think we really would be great to address. One is. Um, uh, Nina, do you want to unmute and read your question here? Sure. Um, so I, I said I'm a little unclear about the extent to which people understood the relationship between the eruption of Tambora and what they were experiencing, especially because at the beginning you said, oh, the fascination is with these smaller eruptions in the Mediterranean, and you showed the Turner painting of Vesuvius. And I think partly I'm wondering if if there's an analogy to today where people are drawn to the more spectacular events, but don't really understand some of the more slow moving or, or more subtle. And I wonder, so I was wondering about that and if that changed over time, their yeah. understanding of the relationship. So the, the short answer to the first part of your question is no, no one had the slightest clue of there being a connection uh, between these events. No, there was no, possibility of, of connecting the dots between a, uh, an event that occurred in colonial, from a European point of view, North Atlantic point of view, the colonial Southeast Asia. I mean, it barely made the newspapers. If you think what was occurring at the time, like the, 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 the last campaign against Napoleon, etc. cetera, 
and our, his, our historiography of the period has followed the same, the same suit, yes? That um, we look at the 18 teens according to a certain paradigm that has to do with our, you know, the usual suspects, which is made, you know, European armies um, in conflict, the demobilization, their demobilization, um, and economic disruption that, that is human cause. This is anthropogenic. Um, and uh, so I think there, the second part of what you said was very interesting. Is there an analogy today between our, our you know, we, how, how can you, we, how do we communicate climate change? You know, there's a, you know, a, a polar bear on a disappearing, disappearing ice flow, um, extreme weather events, a Hurricane Sandy or a Hurricane Maria. Um, you know, how, you know, and this is in the climate communication world, right? In the climate messaging world, this is the perennial confounding problem, right? No one has, no one seems to have the answer to how best to, to communicate climate change. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, millennially difficult, Issue and I in another in another context you know, the the idea of um, that that a colleague of mine at the University of Wisconsin originated called slow violence the you know that we need to think about and this is the idea of a graduated timescale it's like slow violence the operations of slow violence he was thinking about you know colonialism but also you know it applies to to climate as well there are these attenuated operations of, of climate change that have you know, kind of an incremental effect that occasionally explode into, into visible and spectacular forms of violence, you know, like a, like a hurricane or a particularly bad drought, but they're operating uh, the entire time. And how do we create, how do we create narratives from those, right? How do we, um, how do we create a new sort of kind of forms of visibility for these processes that we are subject to, right, and that are you know, recreating and recreating the world in which we operate. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I'm very careful here, and as I'm speaking back to, you know, salute back to Robert's point about, well, how do we talk about agency and adaptation or resilience? You know, these, these, these and sustainability, uh, and in the context of this kind of natural system language that we're also using. Um, it's a great it's a great challenge for us to to find the correct idiom and find the correct languages for talking about this very complex interaction between humans and the ecosystems thank you yeah i think that that's um I think that that's part of the task, obviously anyone is taking up, including this in their classroom. But I also think if you think about how things work with your students, you know, part of it is you giving them the fodder and, right. you know, right. who knows yeah. what they will come up with also. So, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, they're the ones who really have to come up with the answers. <laughs> I mean, because it will be, I mean, whatever problems we have, our generation is facing, think of the, just, <laughs> just extrapolate to the, the uh, seriousness of the problems that, that our students will be facing in their personal and professional lives in the coming decades. I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I don't think, you know, we're not issuing answers. We're more like, here's, here are the problem sets or here are the, here are the different imperatives that need to be reconciled. Here is material for you to ponder. Please, you know, in, you know, in your personal and professional decision making, you know, as as it evolves and you become a mature adult, uh, and you, um, uh, you know, here are the things. Please think about, you know, consider these factors. Um, I think, yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think that's exactly as a teacher, what you hope is that your students will look at situations they encounter as they grow older and ask themselves why. And in yeah. this instance, I think the simple hope is that the answer to that why might be um, some complex relationships between climate and society. Hey, well, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. It's, uh, I was so glad to be able to meet with you and, and good luck to you all in, um, in taking interesting climate historical material and climate science into the classroom. <laughs>